Thank you. <clears throat> Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryan Karava Vahai Tejasvi Navadhi Tamas Duma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Hi Chaitanyam Sarvagam Sarvam Sarva Bhuta Guhashayam Yat Sarva Vishayati Tam Tasmai Sarva Vide Namaha Very good. Welcome back. We continue. We just uh, returned to our study of Upadesha Sara, of, of Upadesha Sahasri. Upadesha Saram, of course, is a text of uh, Ramana Maharshi. This text, of course, by Sri Shankaracharya, it's a brilliant text. I'm glad we've come back to it. And uh, we just started this chapter 14 last week. We'll continue today. Um, this chapter, Swapna Smriti Prakaranam, Swap dream and smriti memory to recap an important part of yesterday's of last week's class <laughs> sorry <laughs> to recap an important part of last week's uh, class that's interesting I have, I should mention this, just because I'm, uh, I have this vertigo, and when I get really dizzy, it's hard to teach. So anyway, we'll see how, how things go today. <coughs> the important uh, part of Lax, uh, several, several, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> I'll try, try again. So there were several topics we discussed last week, but one I'd like you to recall is the fact that conventional wisdom has it that what's in our minds is less real than what's outside. And that seems to be, you know, we have all kinds of imaginations uh, in our minds, and what's outside certainly seems more real than all these pan passing thoughts and fancies in our mind. But we went through an interesting analysis based on the first uh, verse of the text in which uh, Shankaracharya and the commentator makes it especially clear that there's something counterintuitive here because Whatever arises in your mind is immediately and directly known to you, whereas whatever is outside, including this table, is indirectly known to you. The table is known via your, your power of sight. Your, we went through that yes, uh, last week. Your eyes capture an image of it. And through this very complex process, an image of the chair, and the sound, <laughs> not only the image of the chair, of the table, but the sound of me hitting the table, these arise in your mind as mental objects. And it's those mental objects that are directly perceived whereas the form and sound of the table is only indirectly perceived. Isn't that kind of flips common sense on, on its head, but you see the, the correctness of that observation. What you directly perceive is the contents of your mind. Everything else is known to you Everything outside in the world is known to you indirectly by means of your five senses. And that has some significant consequences. And that's what we'll see in the uh, next verse. Bhikshamatanyata swapne 
भिक्षाथन यथा स्वप्ने दृष्टो देहो न सस्वयम् दृष्टो देहो न सस्वयम् जागृतृश्या देहात् जागृतृश्या देहात् द्रष्टृत्वारण्य हे वस द्रष्टृत्वारण्य हे वस I'll remind you that these slides are available on our website if you'd like to print out a copy for yourself. So here Shankara says, Yatha, just as Swapne in your dreams, Bhiksham Atan. Bhiksham is alms received by a sannyasi, a Hindu monk, Atan wandering. Wandering and collecting alms is a metaphor uh, Shankaracharya uses here. Um, in your dreams, wandering and collecting alms. Have you ever dreamed of? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Possible. Probably not. Of course, reflect on the fact that all of Shankara's students were sannyasis. <laughs> That was their world, that was their lifestyle. So he uses that, uh, that metaphor. I suppose uh, in modern times, if Shankara were a householder living today, he'd probably use a metaphor of cooking dinner in a dream. <laughs> so anyway, here he uses the metaphor of sannyasis collecting alms. So you are the sannyasi. This is a metaphor, just yatha, just as bhiksham atan yatha svapne. If you, in your dream, are collecting alms, like any good sannyasi does, twice a day, and in your dream, the dehaha, the physical body that you experience in a dream, you do experience your body in a dream, right? course. That physical body, which is drishtaha, which is seen, which is experienced in a dream, saha nasvayam. That's not really you. <laughs> you experience the body in a dream, but it's not really you. It is, however, watch this, more real then dream, it is more directly perceived than bodies outside when you're awake. Remember, that's what we established in the prior verse. <coughs> Just as this, this table is known to me only indirectly by means of my five senses in exactly the same way, my own body is known to me indirectly by means of my five senses. Now look at the irony here. I find it ironic anyway, that the body of yourself <coughs> collecting alms in a dream, that body is known more directly <laughs> than this physical body outside. Of course, right now, as I experience this physical body outside, in my mind is that direct perception. So in my mind is my mind has created this form of the body, so the body I experience directly is the body in my mind. The body I experience indirectly is this one outside. And so this is a point he makes, and he says, just like the body you see in a dream is not you. You are the observer of the body you see in the dream. He says in the third line, tata, in the same way, they hot with regard to that body, which body now? Jagrat drishyat. With regard to the body that you experience when you're awake. 
this body. We're not talking about the dream body now. This body, which you experience, which you're, which you're awake, drashtratvat anyaha evasaha. This body that I experience when I'm awake is other than me, the observer. Just as the dream body is separate from the observer in the same way, the waking body is separate from the observer. They're both observed by you. Anything observed by you is separate from you. So he's leading now into a more subtle topic. This is actually a fairly obvious observation. And uh, this is what we call Vedanta 101. Vedanta begins with this distinction between subject and object, observer and observed, sakshi, that which is the witness, and that which is witnessed in Sanskrit, sakshya, this fundamental distinction. And we're going to discuss now that distinction as it applies to the mind. Because what, as we said in the introduction, what you directly observe is not the world outside. What you directly observe is a world in your mind. And that's what Shankar is going to explain in the next two verses, which we'll see. Okay. Musha sik yatha tamram musha siktam yatha tamram tannibham jayate tatha tannibham jayate tatha rupadin vyapnu vachittam rupadin vyapnu vachittam tannibham drishyate dhruvam so he's giving a famous metaphor. Let me give you the idea of the metaphor first before we get lost in the uh, Sanskrit words here. In order for you to perceive anything outside, like this body sitting on this chair, it has to become a mental object. And we described in last week's class the complex, the complex process of vision through which light reflects off this object, is strikes your eyeballs, focused by the lens, falling on the retina. We went through all that in the last class. We need not do that again. The outcome of that complex problem of uh, process of sight, the outcome, of course, is a mental Form. How shall we understand that mental form? What is, what is the very idea of the mental form? Can your mind take a form? Well, what exactly is mind? And here there's, uh, there's several ways to approach it. I made reference to, in last week's class, to modern neuroscience and philosophy of mind where they, where they have not come to a conclusive understanding of what is mind and what is its relationship to consciousness that remains an open question in modern science. In ancient times, there was obviously no neuroscience because there were no neurons. They didn't understand what was brain. In fact, here's just, just a funny observation. It took a long time even to understand that the brain was associated with thinking. The ancient Greeks didn't know that. The ancient Greeks thought, at least some of them thought, that the brain was like a radiator for cooling the blood. And I suppose it might have that effect someone. It's up on top where it can radiate heat most effectively. They had no idea that, that, the, that there was a connection. How would they know? 
even in the West, it wasn't really known until the famous story of Phineas Gage. Did you ever hear this story? So Phineas Gage was a railroad worker maybe three centuries ago or so in this country, I think in this country, and he was, um, he was using, he was tamping dynamite to get ready to blast some rock with a rod. And as he is blast, as he's tamping down this dynamite or powder, the powder exploded and the rod penetrated. It entered his face at one point and went through his brain and came out the other side. Somehow, they managed to remove that rod and he survived. And in those days that he would survive was very surprising, at least 200 years ago. I'm not sure the exact date. Anyway, he survived, but everyone knew that Phineas had changed. <laughs> His emotions were, were very uh, jumbled. He was very quick to react. He wasn't the same Phineas that he was before. And believe it or not, this famous case of Phineas Gage was the first time that Western medical science clearly and irrefutably established a connection between brain and mind. Believe it or not, it wasn't well understood until just several hundred years ago. And the reason I'm sharing that story with you is to explain why even today <laughs> scientists are struggling with mind, not brain and mind they, they've got. And they're, they're continuing to define more and more clearly what is the relationship between brain and mind they're currently mapping activities in the brain to mental uh, experiences. And that mapping is in its infancy. It will continue and it will grow for decades and maybe centuries to come. But what those same scientists are unable to explain is that when the brain produces mental forms, and we have to come back to that now, that's our verse. When your brain produces mental forms, those mental forms are known to you. How is the crucial question that science can't answer, or they're trying to answer, and we must answer, and we will answer that hopefully later <laughs> in this class, we'll see how it goes. But before that, what do we mean by mental form? So from the standpoint of science, the brain creates something called thoughts. And ev even that is not, there's some mapping between brain and mental experiences, but it's not well understood. And the problem you remember from the first class is the brain is physical, the mind is not. This leads to some huge philosophical problems we talked about quite a bit in the prior class and we'll refer to those same problems in today's class and perhaps future classes. Now, let's, let's reflect on that. The brain has physicality. Mind has no physicality. Does it mean that the mind doesn't exist? No one would say that, right? You experience the mind. The mind is a non-physical existence. And this is one of the places science stumbles because science is all designed to study physical stuff and mind is not a physical stuff. In ancient India, they didn't have that problem because their worldview was very different than in modern science. Modern science views the world in terms of matter and energy, as you know very well. You also probably remember that in ancient India, they viewed the world not in terms of matter and energy, but in terms of the three gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas. But there's something more you need to know about this ancient world view, and that is, 
elements com were composed of these three gunas, but those elements could be physical elements or non-physical elements. In ancient times, they embraced the concept of the evolution of matter that first the gunas became five non-physical elements, and then those non-physical elements went through a process of transmutation in which they became physical elements. Some of you may have studied this before. It's called panchi karana. Panchi karana is a process through which five non-physical elements, subtle elements, <coughs> in Sanskrit, sukshma bhuta, bhuta elements, which are sukshma, subtle, as opposed to stula, physical. So in ancient times, they thought there were five origin in the generation of the universe, in cosmology, how the, how the physical universe came into existence, not a big bang, but rather they envisioned that the first arose five non-physical elements, sukshma bhutas, those non-physical elements went through a process of recombination and became the five physical elements out of which the universe is, is composed, which means they had a world view that very nicely explained non-physical stuff. So just as your body is made of physical elements, your mind is made of non-physical elements. It made perfect sense, and it's a helpful way of understanding what science still struggles with. You're the, and the bottom line is this. The mind exists as a non-physical reality experienced by you. Ancient science had this explanation in terms of five subtle elements. Modern science struggles with non-physical realities. But no one can deny, actually a few weird philosophers try their best to even deny the existence of mind. And they come up with some very peculiar arguments. You can actually find those arguments if you go, go looking for them. But it goes against our experience. We all experience mind. And in our minds are forms like the form of Swami Tadatmananda. So now the question becomes, non-physical things have no form, right? <laughs> and yet we perceive form. And that's what Shankara is going to explain in this verse and the next. How we perceive forms with our formless minds. He gives two Drishtantas, two metaphors. First, he gives a metaphor of, oh, now, now we'll let, let, let him tell us. He says that yatha, just like tamram, molten copper. Molten copper is asiktam, poured. Poured into a musha, a, a form. I think they would use like clay, perhaps, or some, some other, probably clay. Uh, and a clay, a clay mold, hollowed out in the form of what you wanted to create from the molten copper. So you pour, by the way, they still use that same process in making some of the beautiful uh, bronze deities. Yes, they still, that tradition continues even today. Anyway, so imagine a clay form hollowed out. You pour the molten copper in. Notice molten copper, anything liquid has no form. But it solidifies inside the mold and it takes form. 
So that which is formless can assume form. He says, tannibham jayate, that molten copper, tannibham, in the same form, jayate, it assumes, it becomes. So that just as molten copper, pole, which is formless, poured into a mold, assumes the form of that mold. Molten copper assumes a form. Tata, in the same way, in the same way, chittam, I'm just checking the grammar here, jayate rupadin. I think we, ha we have to make that connection. That rupadin um, in the second line actually goes to both the drishtanta and the darshtanta, goes to the first half of the verse and to the second half of the verse. So that molten copper assumes rupadin, these various forms, tannibham, according to the nature of the form, the uh, mold, I'm sorry, in the same way, chittam, mind, mind which is formless like molten copper, that molten copper, yapnuvat, being that which pervades rupadin, the forms in your mind, that chittam, mind, formless mind, tannibham, jayate, it assumes the form of whatever you perceive, drishyate, of whatever is perceived by your mind, Dhruvam, without any doubt. So here's the first of two metaphors. Just as molten copper assumes the form when it's pulled into, poured into a form, formless molten copper can assume a form. In the same way, your formless mind stuff. Notice I said stuff. It exists, not in a physical way, but in a non-physical way. So the so-called stuff, the material out of which your mind is made, it assumes the form of whatever is picked up by your senses. So right now, you perceive a body out here. In your mind, that body is formed in your mind and what is that body? The body out here is made of flesh and bones. The body inside here that you perceive directly is made of mind stuff. Just like something made of molten copper is made of copper, the body you, you perceive in your mind is made of mind stuff. Oh, just before we go on, just, just to help you understand this ancient concept of this pre-scientific concept. They, they explained everything, even sight. Now, la in last week's class, we discussed sight is you know, understood through science. Light reflects off my body. It's collated by the lenses on your eyeballs. It's in ends up as two tiny inverted images on the retinas of your left and right eyes through the optic nerve. You, so we went through all this before. So in ancient India, you'd be very surprised by how they envision. So think, if you lived in a pre-scientific society, how would you explain that? You would know nothing about photons, You'd know nothing about how lenses collate light, all of that. So without knowing modern science, how would you explain it if you lived in ancient India? The way they explained it is this. That mind stuff is non-physical, right? So that which is non-physical has no form, therefore it's not confined to a physical place. Mind stuff is not stuck inside your head because it's not physical. That which is physical can be confined. Your brain is confined inside your head. 
that's a good thing, but that which is not physical cannot be confined within your head. Therefore, they envisioned that your mind stuff went out through your eyes <laughs> and contacted whatever, in fact, it's even stranger than that. This is actually discussed in great length in some commentaries. Your, br your mind becomes extended in space in such a way that it reaches the object you perceive. So imagine your, your mind now extending out and reaching me. That's not too surprising. Think about looking at the stars at night. <laughs> your mind stuff extending out to vast distances and then your mind stuff contacts the object, so right now your mind stuff contacts me, takes my form, and then returns. <laughs> I have this funny image of something being emitted and then being <laughs> withdrawn. It's very weird, but that's basically how they envisioned it. Your mind form extended and made contact and they didn't, they didn't describe it as being emitted and withdrawn. That's my silly idea. They just envisioned it was emitted and took the form of whatever. So you, and that makes sense. You know, for a pre-scientific society, it makes quite a bit of sense. Your mind stuff is not stuck inside your head because it's non-physical. Why should it not contact me? and take my form. It's a reasonable explanation. We have better scientific explanations, but from a pre-scientific point of view, it's actually quite an insightful explanation. But as an explanation, as a metaphor, it still is defective. Remember, we've had this discussion several times. All metaphors by definition, are defective. They're useful to a point, but there is no such thing as a metaphor which is perfect. If it were perfect, it wouldn't be a metaphor. It would be the actual thing. So all metaphors have defects. This metaphor also has defect, and that is that the mold is a physical thing. We're not dealing with any physical things here. Well, there are physical things outside, but that uh, the limitation of the metaphor perhaps is better expressed like this, that molten copper solidifies. Does your mind <laughs> <laughs> solidify, you, you get the point. So this is the defect or shortcoming of the metaphor, which is why Shankara gives another metaphor, which we'll see right now. Vyanjako vayata loko, Vyanjako vayata loko, Vyangasya karatamiyat, Vyangas yakaratam hiyat sarvartha vyanjakatva dhir. And that dhir word has to be added in the third line. Listen again. Sarvartha vyanjakatva dhir. Sarvartha vyanjakatva dhir. Artha kara pradrishyate, artha kara pradrishyate. So the editor gets minus points here. The editor, of course, is me. <laughs> All right. So here's the second metaphor Shankara gives. Va, or, here comes the alternative explanation. Yata, just like alokaha, light just like light, which is vyanjakaha, a, that which reveals. Just like light reveals, what does light reveal? The akaratam, actually light 
iat assumes akaratam, the form, the form of vyangasya. It's some technical terminology used here. So there's a revealer and a revealed. Light is the revealer, that's vyanjaka, and then there is the revealed technical term vyangas, vyanga is that which is revealed. Don't worry about the terminology, it's not that common. So light reveals how? So this is an alternative explanation to the mold and copper. So light is also formless. That formless light strikes me and it assumes my form. I appear, they actually got this right. I appear not in a, to you, not in a form of flesh, I appear in the form of light, correct? It's not that you're perceiving flesh or cloth, you are perceiving light. They got that right. For, for pre-scientific society, they did okay. <laughs> Science is more accurate, but, but they, did, they did surprisingly well. So they say that just as Shankara says here, just like formless light assumes the form of the object revealed in the same way Dihi, that's that word you have to pick up here. Dihi here means mind. Dihi means buddhi, but here it means mind. So in the same way, dihi, your mind, sarva artha vyanjakatvat, your mind being the revealer, just like light, which is formless, reveals in the same way your mind is formless, reveals, it reveals how artha akara, your mind reveals by assuming the form of whatever you perceive, just like light appears, just like I am revealed to you by this light taking my form in the same way in your mind objects are revealed to you by your mind taking this form light so copper the previous example copper takes a form but that's the that's very that's too solid of, for us that's a defect of the metaphor so here's a metaphor it's still a metaphor but it's less defective so that light takes my form you perceive my form as light i exist to you in the form of light in the same way the swami taratmananda in your mind appears to you in the form of mind, mind stuff. There is a, a form of Swami Taratmananda in your mind. Now I'm putting this aside because there's a topic I introduced in the, pre, in the first class and it's, it's a important topic. Shankara doesn't treat it directly here he, we have seen portions of the topic before. We will see much more in future chapters, but I think it's important for us to have this particular discussion right now. A discussion of how it is that these forms in your mind, your mind assumes these various forms, and Shankara has given two ways of explaining that. These forms are known you how now again and again we use this very simple language to say you are that consciousness which reveals the contents 
of your mind. Allow me to say that one more time. This is crucial. Notice I didn't say consciousness reveals. I said you are you in your essential nature. You, and this, allow me to make a point here. This is where a lot of people get go, and a lot of teachers of Vedanta go off. Consciousness reveals everything. But how do I know it? <laughs> See the problem? So it's important to distinguish here that you are that very consciousness that reveals the forms that arise in your mind. By the way, those forms are not just physical forms, but forms of sound, forms of taste, forms of touch, forms of smell, whatever you perceive with your five senses. So all, all five of those forms arise in the mind and are known, and you are the consciousness which is the knower of those forms. You are the consciousness which reveal, and this is a metaphor, you are the consciousness that reveals those forms, like the sun reveals objects. But notice that's a metaphor. Consciousness is not light. There's no light bulb inside, right? No light bulb. So something I'd like you to reflect on, and this is a very deep topic, and looking at the clock, we may or may not uh, uh, proceed too far with this topic today. But here's a huge problem. You are the observer. The form in your minds are observed. Observer, observed. Witness, witnessed. Knower, known. I thought this was a Dvaita Vedanta. <laughs> Non-dual. Vedanta. We've created a dualism. And this is the same dualism that in Western philosophy goes back to Descartes. They call it substance dualism. The nature of the mind and the nature of the body are two different substances. A physical, actually a little bit like a uh, like, like the ancient rishis, there's a physical substance, there's a non-physical substance. So this, is, this goes back to Descartes. And by the way, they still argue. <laughs> the arguments that started with Descartes 400-some years ago, those arguments still play out today. Anyway, Cartesian dualism is a dualism between observer and observe, between... He would call it between mind and body. We would call it between sakshi, a wearful witness, and sakshya, that which is witnessed. So, you might say then, well, if it's so obviously dualistic, why do we use this teaching? And the answer is, in a, for a very pragmatic reason. It describes our experience. The teachings of Vedanta, first and foremost, must accurately describe our experience. And here's the trick. We can ex explain our experience first in a very simple way. For example, my hand is a physical object. This table, actually this is off the uh, video, so let me do it here. <laughs> For the sake of all, uh, there, there, there are many more students watching online than there are students here, so let me address these uh, students watching online. So this, this, this leg is a physical object. My hand is a physical object. This physical object hits this physical object. We explain experience. But now, there are more refined ways of explaining that experience. For example, the exa uh, actually I've given this example several times. 
My hand is made of atoms. On the outer layer of my hand are atoms. On the outer layer of my body and this cloth are atoms. On the outside of every atom is a cloud of negatively charged electrons. So on the outside of every atom in my hand is a cloud of negatively charged electrons. The same applies to my, to my uh, leg and the cloth. And we all know that negatively charged particles repel each other. So the negatively charged clouds of electrons of my hand and the cloud, negatively charged clouds of electrons in my leg <laughs> repel each other. Notice, it's a more refined explanation of what we experience. That's what Vedanta does. So suppose, suppose you try to explain to a two-year-old negative what I just explained. <laughs> Neg clouds of negatively charged light. It do doesn't work. So you have to begin with a simple explanation before you move on to more refined explanations. This is precisely how Vedanta works. And what I've just shared with you is something that is rarely discussed and is a problem. because It should be discussed. It must be discussed. This is one of my, my favorite topics. You've heard me talk about it before. Vedanta is not a collection of statements of fact. Vedanta is a collection of teaching methodologies. So we start with a simple method of, method of understanding and we proceed to more sophisticated ways of understanding. It's like crossing a stream. There are a series of stepping stones, one after another after another. This accurately describes Vedanta. And this also answers the question, why do we begin by talking about dualism? You are the observer of the observed. Absolutely dualistic, but that's where we begin. That's the first of the stepping stones. Then we can proceed to a more, by the way, if you skip over a stepping stone, you end up in the water. <laughs> so it's not advised to, to skip these stones. So we start with this very simple observation that you are the consciousness that, is, that reveals the presence that knows, the presence that witnesses the presence of forms in your mind. The problem, of course, is it's completely dualistic, <laughs> as, as much so as Descartes. So we begin there, and now we have to move ahead. And we move ahead by using two... There could be three or more, but we're going to focus on two primary explanations which, res which attempt to resolve that apparent duality. Um, one of which we've already discussed, the other of which we haven't discussed. The one we've discussed is the in prior classes, if you, if you haven't attended all the prior classes. Of course, all the videos are available online. But re you remember, in fact, let me go to the board. It's just easier to explain with a picture. Yep, you press. Good, excellent. Okay. So here is an attempt to remove this dualism between observer and observed with regard to you being consciousness and the observed is what? 
mind. Mind stuff forms in your mind. The metaphor will be familiar to all of you from our prior classes where you have a bucket of water, the bucket representing our bodies, the water representing our mind stuff. In fact, it's a good metaphor. The body has a physical form. Water is relatively formless, but the bucket can hold the formless water, just like your brain, perhaps, can hold formless mind. But now the metaphor is, as you remember, the sun shines on that bucket of water and is reflected. Notice that the water has forms in it, ripples. So, the, so water can be formless, the water could be perfectly still, or the water can, form, can assume the form of these ripples, which are the two metaphors that Shankara gave, like molten copper assuming the form of the uh, mold, like light assuming the form of the object it's revealing. In the same way, here we have formless water assuming the form of ripples. And we have the sunlight shining. That doesn't look like a sun. Sun always the children. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the sun has to be happy, <laughs> shining happily. So the uh, sun represents, of course, the so-called light of consciousness. And here's, watch how the dualism is resolved. So you are the conscious observer. What does that mean? Your consciousness is reflected by the mind and that reflected consciousness is what you're experiencing right now. Notice that the, the light coming down is formless. Consciousness in and of itself, nirakara, formless. But when that, when that formless light is reflected from the forms formed by the water, representing the forms in your mind, light is conditioned by these ripples. Reflected light is conditioned light. And that's what we experience. Right now, your consciousness, because it has reflected from, because it is reflected in your mind, it then gets conditioned by the ripples, the forms in your mind, and this reflected consciousness, conditioned consciousness, is what you experience right now. Now, again, we, we still have a little problem with duality. We've got actually three now. <laughs> <laughs> we've got light, we've got bucket, and we've got water. And by the way, we're going to come, I think th this is just a hint at a larger topic. I think we'll take up much of the next class with this topic. Because the bucket and water can be less real than the light. And I'll have to make this, this clear in our next class. Remember our Vedantic dis, uh, distinction between satyam and mithya. That's how we resolve 
the duality here. We'll do that in our next class. And so in our next class, we'll show how what is absolutely real is light. Notice what you're experiencing is consciousness, which is absolutely real. But that consciousness has been conditioned by the nature of the surface of the water. And just to introduce our next class, this concept of reflected consciousness is known as pratibhimbavara, the doctrine of reflection, and this is these, I'm introducing the topic for the next class, so we'll discuss this pratibhimbavara, we're talking about reflected consciousness, and we'll also talk about another explanation which focuses on conditioned consciousness. There's some similarity anyway, but when we talk about conditioned consciousness, we talk about of a cheda. Vada is a term used in Sanskrit. Vada means doctrine. So the teaching of of reflected consciousness, pratibhimba vada, the reflection of, of, of uh, the, uh, the conditioned consciousness of a cheda vada. And these two, I think we leave the slide off. Just stay on cam. Go back to just uh, cam. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Cam, but but close up. Yeah. There's so many buttons to push. <laughs> yeah, so if you go to cam and board, then you get me here, but we want me here. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll conclude our class here. What are we doing now? Just to make it very clear. So we start on that first stepping stone. You are the observer, and whatever happens in your mind is the observed. Now we're ready to go to the next stepping stone, a more nuanced understanding of the relationship between consciousness and mind. That is a central topic in this chapter, and as I said, Shankara has We've treated Pratibhimbavada quite extensively in prior classes. We haven't touched Avacheda Vada yet. So I really want to get into that topic here. We'll do that in our next class. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma kashchidduhka bhagvaveta asatoma sadgamaya tamasoma jyotirgamaya mrityor ma amritangamaya om shanti 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 om satsat.